Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll start letting uh, folks in. Uh, so we'll give a few minutes for that and then we'll get started with uh, the presentation today. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us for our fall um, EP Distinguished Speaker Series. The presentation today uh, is titled A Diagnosis of Disturbed Rivers and it'll be presented by Alan Gellis. Um, Alan is an adjunct faculty member um, at the Whiting School and teaches for our Engineering for Professionals uh, in the Environmental Program. Um, he's a research geomorphologist with the U.S. Geological Survey. He received his PhD from Colorado State University in geology. He spent his career studying sediment as it relates to land use and climate and has worked in a variety of geomorphic settings, including Puerto Rico, the Southwest, the Midwest, and the Mid-Atlantic regions. His research examines sediment budgets with a focus on geochemical sediment fingerprinting. Uh, so I will uh, hand the microphone over to Alan. Uh, Alan, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Let me know when you, do you see the uh, slide? Yep, I can see it, but it's, uh, it's, yep, there we go, perfect. Okay, great. Again, thank you for the nice introduction and good afternoon on this beautiful uh, fall day. I think I'm going to uh, turn off my camera. Um, so the title of my talk, A Diagnosis of Disturbed Rivers, is in a sense a study of behavior, of river behavior. And I'd like to start, my talk off with sort of a little bit of folklore that my colleagues in physics might not be aware of. And the story goes that when Albert Einstein's oldest son, Hans, told his father, I wish to pursue sediment transport as a career, Albert is reportedly to have said, oh no, 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 don't study that, that's much too difficult. <laughs> of course, it turns out that Hans Einstein the sole engineer is known for many of his models on sediment transport and bedlam. So what I'm gonna talk about today is I'm gonna actually report out on a recent EPA report that describes the status of our nation's rivers. I'll, get, I'll then go in a little background, bringing some memories if you've taken geomorphology 101, because I think it's important to understand some fundamentals for this talk of geomorphology. And I'll look at some of the tools and emerging technologies we are using to diagnose and understand the fluvial system. Um, much of what I'm going to talk about is taught in my online class, Sediment Transport and River Mechanics. And the next time that class will be offered is in the spring of, of 2023. Finally, I want to thank folks from the Whiting School of Engineer who have helped me through the years uh, put together this course. Okay, so as I mentioned in the opening, this year EPA published a report on the status of our nation's rivers five decades after the passing of the Clean Water Act. The report, the report card is basically a failure. With over half uh, our nation's rivers not meeting standards and goals outlined in the Clean Water Act. So it's really, I would say, getting a D right now. Now, the Clean Water Act was passed in 1972 to establish a structure for regulating discharges of pollutants into the waters of the United States and regulating quality standards for surface waters. In simple terms, the Clean Water Act was to make our nation's rivers uh, drinkable, swimmable, and fishable. Now, what's interesting is the Clean Water Act was in part inspired by some really 
tragic stories that occurred in the 50s and 60s. And this is, many of you might have heard of this, when the Cuyahoga River caught fire in Ohio. And it turns out that was many, one of many times that the river had caught fire. But in the 50s and 60s, a lot of alarming things were happening. There was raw sewage in the Hudson, a record-breaking number of fish kills across the country. You know, I grew up in New York, and I remember as a kid, just garbage floating up on our nation's beaches. Um, also, as part of the Clean Water Act, the states were required to regulate the pollutants in what's known as the Daily Maximum Load Framework, TMDL Framework. It's often referred to as the diet of the river. This is where the states set up regulations, like we need to re reduce phosphorus by so many pounds, sediment by so many pounds, and thus it's kind of got that cliche term, it's the diet set for the rivers. Well, according to the report, about 80% of the TMDLs are not meeting their target goals for reducing pollution. So again, this is really a dismal sort of picture of what's happening to our nation in terms of their waterways. And if you look inside the report, it shows a map of total stream length or miles that are impaired. And you'll notice the brighter colors, you know, they're, they're basically occurring in the Midwest and West because they're larger states, they have larger, you know, miles of stream length. So that's why California really, in a sense, is, is a darker color than, than Delaware. But look at Texas. Texas, oh wow, Texas seems to be doing well. Well, there's another map here. This shows the percent of river and stream miles that haven't been assessed in the last six to 10 years. So here we're looking at Texas at 82%. Many of these states haven't been assessed. The mileage of the, of the stream lengths just have not been assessed in the last uh, six to 10 years. Um, there's some good stories. Colorado has 93% of its rivers assessed. And, and here in Maryland, it's not bad. It's about 88% of um, our river miles have been uh, assessed. Now, the causes of impairment uh, are shown here, and they're related to temperature, pollution such as fertilizers, lack of enforcement and part of the state agencies tasked with setting up guidelines, and outdated effluent standards, where it was found that two thirds of EPA's water pollution standards for industries are more than 30 years old, despite a Clean Water Act mandate that they be re-examined every five to 10 years to keep pace with improving uh, pollution control technology. But finally, and in my view, this is the most important, and it's gonna bring in the crux of my lecture, is that the Clean Water Act was designed to control point source or pipe discharge, whereas it is non-point source pollution, which is often the major cause of river impairment. But what is non-point source pollution? This includes fertilizers, urban runoff, salt, acid mine drainage, bacteria, and finally sediment. And sediment that originates from a variety of sources, including construction sites, roads, agriculture, and stream banks of the river channel. So to give you an example of what I'm talking about, these are some of the uh, non-point source uh, examples. So on the left-hand side, you can see non-point source runoff from agricultural fields, a construction site on the upper right, <laughs> an example of stream bank erosion, and uh, mining and dirt roads are also non-point source, sources of, of pollution. Now, impairments like sediment are also ranked in the states, like with nutrients and pathogens. And in the entire United States, sediment is the number two cause of impairment in our stream miles. And in Maryland, it is actually the leading cause of, 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 of pollutions, you know, of pollutants in our state. So sediment is a major problem. And problems that are associated with sediment include things like reservoir sedimentation, uh, aquatic habitat, it clogs gills, it buries substrate, reduces light, and which, which affects photosynthesis, which is the big problem in Chesapeake Bay. Uh, we get losses of channel conveyance where we need dredging. It also impacts drinking water. Uh, this is a picture of a Shokin Reservoir 
in the Catskill Mountains uh, of New York. Now, this is where New York gets its water supply from. And when turbidity hits a certain level, New York literally has to turn off its faucets. And they have a very aggressive monitoring and remediation program to reduce sediment. Sediment is also a receptor of azure pollutants like phosphorus and heavy metals. So there's really a lot of problems associated with sediment. Okay, now I'm going to bring us back to your Geomorph 101 class, talking about a little bit about sediment, something called the lane balance, and I'll discuss channel equilibrium. Well, there's sediment and there's sediment. And there's basically three modes of sediment transport, suspended bed load and dissolved load. And except for tropical rivers where dissolved loads and high weathering environments, dissolved, load, dissolved solids can be important. Suspended sediment and bed load are usually the major modes of transport. Bed load is coarse material that rolls and slides along the channel bed. And suspended sediment is typically silts, clays, and silts that remain in suspension. And of the two, suspended sediment in most rivers is generally the greatest load, greater than about 70%. So sediment plays an important role in determining the equilibrium state of stream channels. <clears throat> Together with discharge and channel slope, it defines a balance, an equilibrium known as the lane balance uh, that determines the stability of channels. Now, E.W. Lane was an engineer in four columns that published this concept in 1955. Basically, it's showing driving and resisting forces as it would affect a channel. The driving forces are flow, and, are flow and slope, and the resisting forces are sediment. So if you increase any of these on the lane balance, the channel is going to respond by either filling called aggradation or incision called degradation. And I'll show some examples of this. So for example, let's look at a natural uh, geologic phenomenon that might increase sediment that being the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980. That supplied a large amount of sediment to the system. And if you look at the lane balance, that should cause aggradation and fill. And it turns out that is exactly what happened. Uh, this is a picture of the North Fork Toodle River, which drains Mount St. Helens. There was so much sediment brought down the valley and into the stream systems that they became clogged with sediment and they basically turned into braided river systems. So here's an, an excellent you know, example of, of, of putting too much sediment into the system. The, sediment, the system can't transport it and, it and it causes it to aggrade and change its channel shape and equilibrium. Well, another example, and this time I'm gonna bring up a human example of tipping the scale is with slope or channel gradient which if we increase the slope of a channel, we expect to see incision. Well, an example of increasing channel gradient occurred when we channelized rivers. And this is an example from a river in Tennessee, which was a meandering channel shown in the uh, yellow-orange color. And for a number of reasons, they cut off the channel. That increased the gradient of the channel. And the adjustment processes that follow, this is an example from other, other channelized rivers, is that they cut down, they eroded. There was a lot more energy and, stream, and shear stress and stream power in the system, causing the channels to incise. And in the bottom left, you can see a channel in Mississippi. This wave of erosion actually moves through the watershed. Here we're seeing the upper limits of that erosion as it stopped at probably a road embankment, and that's where the head cut stopped. Now, channelization is a common practice that occurred between 1940 and 1970, and probably thereafter. Uh, a lot of river miles, river kilometers of the US were channelized. Some areas like the Midwest, uh, in, for example, uh, Illinois, as much as 80 to 100% of the headwater streams were channelized. And we're still seeing those effects today. I've been out to these channels in the Midwest and you can still see the effects of channelization. In fact, we depict those changes in what's called stages of channel evolution. What's happening is, is when you disturb a channel, it goes through a series of stages 
to, because it wants to come to a new equilibrium. And this is a great example of a channel trying to come to a new equilibrium. equilibrium. This is a series showing channel cross sections at one location through time. And the bottom is the longitudinal profile of the channel going from downstream to upstream. Well, if you look at a cross section, this one shows stage one. This is prior to channelization. This is what the channel looked like. Channelization occurred. It began to incise. It basically incises to a point which oversteepens the channel and channel erosion or stream bank erosion begins to occur. At some point, the channel widens where depth is lowered, stream power decreases, and the, and the channel begins to aggrade. And basically, it begins to aggrade to a point to develop a new dynamic equilibrium. And there's still sediment coming in from upstream because if you look at the bottom longitudinal profile, we see that these changes occur from downstream to upstream. In other words, where the channel was, where, where the, the reach of the channel that was channelized created head cuts and those moved upstream through the system. So in this sort of um, example, stage six or the later stage is in the downstream reaches and these upstream reaches are still going through changes. So you could go to the Midwest right now and you could see these, these stages in different portions of the watershed. Okay, now I want you to think back to what I discussed about channels being in an equilibrium with flow and sediment. And just think about, think about all the human and natural forcings that are occurring when it comes to flow and sediment, as well as channel gradient. Mines, urbanization, wildfire, fires, dam, there's a lot more. All these are upsetting channel equilibrium and have been doing so for a long time. And thus, this is why we see the report card of channels in a really disturbed state. There's actually a, a great way to show this. This is a slide that shows um, sort of an example of channel of, of, of land use changes that occurred in the United States since uh, European colonization. This was put together by Reds Wallman, one of our greatest geomorphologists and a professor at Johns Hopkins University. He depicted how land use changes uh, affected sediment for the Northeast United States, really around the DC area. And what we see is sediment yield or sediment production through time. Now, beginning in the 1800s, agriculture became a major sort of land use in the United States. And when you cut down trees, you increase sediment yield. And this occurred for a long period of time until basically due to economic regions, uh, we switched from agriculture, forests began appearing. But in a lot of these areas around the cities especially, they began to grow after World War II, suburbanization, the inner cities began to grow. And what you see is the spike in sediment as a result of construction activities, which put a tremendous amount of sediment into the system. Now, Reds depicted this out to 2000. This was published in the 60s. But there was a spike in construction. And then what he thought was, well, the cities would become paved over and that would cut off all sources of sediment. So we'd be actually go down to this low sediment yield. And that is not the case, as I'm going to show later. So... Think about agriculture and what's happened in, in this country. Um, these are some examples from, you know, the 1930s Dust Bowl era, the Dust Bowl era, but this is before we were doing soil conservation on the landscape. So that reds wall in part of the curve, that's agriculture before there were any soil conservation practices. This is what actually caused the uh, Dust Bowl in the 1930s. This is from wind erosion. But certainly we had a lot of water erosion. You could see gullying, rilling, and all this sediment was brought down to the river channels. Well, remember the Mount St. Helens example. What happens when you bring sediment down to these channels? They aggrade and they fill with sediment. And that's exactly what happened in the period following uh, and during the agricultural era. Sediment actually washed down these channels. 
And what's fascinating is if you walk into most channels from the Midwest to the Northeast, not in this, just in this country, even Australia has this, you see the older sediment on the lower parts of the stream banks. You can see it's called pre-settlement peak on the left-hand side. And above that was all the sediment that came off of agricultural lands was deposited on top of that. We call this legacy sediment. On the right-hand side, is an example from Big Spring Run near Lancaster County. Again, the bottom horizon, a very much an organic, peat-rich horizon, was then filled with agricultural sediment. And we get this legacy sediment. And it put a lot more sediment onto these stream banks than were there when, uh, you know, when Columbus sailed here. Well, the story gets actually even more interesting. Uh, we're finding that what may have accelerated the deposition of this sediment on the floodplain, and this is work by Dorothy Merritts and Bob Walters from Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster. When they started investigating the role of mill dams in storing sediment in our rivers. Now, when the Europeans arrived to America, they needed power. And they brought their technology at that time for power from Europe, which were mills. And on the right is a map of mills that are existing or extinct in just one county, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Now, we all know there's lots of mills around. Think about when we drive around, Glisten's Mill, Powder Mill. There were mills everywhere. And you could see there's really a high density in just one county. They've also showed this for other counties. They showed the same density of mills. So they were everywhere. Now think what mills and dams do. What they do is they store sediment until they become completely filled with sediment. And some dams do and some dams don't. And these were small dams, most of these mills. Some, some were actually pretty large, but in general, they were sort of run of the river, small uh, structures. On the right is actually the longitudinal profile from two creeks out of that map that I showed. It shows the dams as these vertical colored bars, but notice what happened. The sediment actually from one dam goes as far upstream to reach the other dam. So you just get this complete filling of these, of these stream systems with sediment. You can see there's, you know, the scale here is in meters, but we get meters of filling of vertical sediment on top of that as a result of these dams. But these dams, they don't last forever. There's no longer active mills around. We turned to other sources of energy. They weren't kept up and they failed. This is an example of just a failed dam that was in a, a, a creek I worked in, Smith Creek, Virginia. I mean, there's not much left of it, but you can see there were structures in the river that completely crossed the river, but again, have failed through time. So think about, think about that. These dams have failed, but then we had this tremendous sediment behind the dams. Sure enough, that's what happened. The river cut through the deposit and left on the banks this tremendous amount of sediment, again, legacy sediment. And this is a great example. This is actually uh, the West Branch of Little Conestoga. We had to get a ladder to climb the banks there, several meters high. All the rivers I walk into in the East Coast, you can see this package of sediment. It translates to a large amount of stream bank erosion. And this is I'm going to show later, it turns out to be a really important source of sediment in our rivers. That's what's eroding from the stream banks. And a lot of that is legacy sediment. Now, I'm going to throw this in. Uh, my talk isn't really on remediation, on how we control sediment as a problem. That would be another talk in itself. But I'll just, I'll just put this in here. What's really interesting is there is actually a sediment remediation approach where they go in and they bulldoze and they just remove the legacy sediment. So they're trying to bring back and restore the floodplain to what it was pre-European colonization. And this is just an example from Big Spring Run, the extent that was uh, bulldozed. And you know, when they're trying to reconnect the floodplain, if you lower the floodplain, the hydro period increases and there's more sediment deposition. And data from Big Spring Ryan actually shows that there is a decrease in sediment over time. So it's quite of an, an interesting sort of approach to reducing sediment. Now, remember I showed that Red's Wallman curve and he was showing agriculture and construction. 
But what Reds didn't know at the time was the input of bank erosion. And we're not seeing low levels of sediment production that occurred when the, when the colonists arrived. It's still remaining high, in part from agriculture still being an important source of sediment and bank erosion now being an important source of sediment in our, in our river systems. So here I wanna take a pause and talk about sort of what I'm pointing out of as um, really the two main sources of sediment that I showed so far. And those being agriculture, construction, sort of topsoil erosion, which we, we refer to as upland erosion sources. Um, the other major source of sediment that I just showed is channel sources, stream banks. And think about how you would control these sediment from these sources. I mean, if agriculture is still a major source of sediment, what are you going to do? You're going to bring in soil conservation practices. You're going to do farming practices, grass waterways, contour plowing, plantings. If stream banks turn out to be the major source of sediment, you're probably going to bring in an engineering design or major stream plantings. So really what this translates to is thus where sediment comes from has tremendous economic implications in terms of how we control it. So for example, a stream bank's a major source of sediment. This is a before and after photo. We might look to engineering designs. If agriculture is a major source of sediment, maybe we're looking at grass waterways or some type of, you know, plantings that occur to reduce sediment. So how do we determine whether it's upland versus channel sources of sediment? How do we decide what we're going to bring in? And this is really bringing in now my main areas of research. This is an example of Linganore Creek in Frederick County during high flows, turbid river. So what I've been researching is something that's been known as sediment fingerprinting. The principle is that potential sediment sources are characterized by the suite of physical and chemical properties, the fingerprints. And where we compare these fingerprints from the source areas to what we see in transport, we can determine the relative importance or percentages of these different sources. And fingerprinting is done on fine sediment because that's where we see most of the chemical activity. This is done on silts and clays. So I kind of have a cartoon that sort of displays how it works. You have a watershed, it has its sources, and those might be the forest, cropland, stream banks. This is just a hypothetical example. Um, each of them we sample for elemental chemistry. And it turns out that in most of these systems look at, they have a diagnostic fingerprint. During this erosion cycle, it's mixed and moves downstream where we sample that sediment and send it off to the laboratory. We then go through a series of statistical methods to allocate the sediment sources, which really relies heavily on stepwise discriminant function analysis and an unmixing model and error analysis, very much a multivariate parametric data re reduction approach. And within that is, is, is really relying on discriminant function analysis to determine if these sources are separated by which elements. So this is an example from the Catskill Mountains, which has geologic sources of sediment. You can see there's nice discrimination in the fingerprints we use. And this is a, a, a watershed on the right from Iowa where we had cropland, dirt roads, and stream banks as the major sources of sediment. Also discriminated nice, nicely. Occasionally, you know, there's some overlap between some of these sources, and, and that's okay. So we then after we run the model, we, after we have uh, all the statistics, we run a mixing model. And just to, so, <laughs> to throw some math in my presentation, we basically solve for a series of linear, linear equations. And we're looking for the smallest error, error term to decide how to apportion uh, sediment to its sources. And we come up with answers like this. And managers love this. It's 55% banks, it's X percent cropland, and so on. That's the kind of uh, results we get from sediment fingerprint. Now, the fingerprints we use var vary. These are just some examples. Again, I use elemental analysis from ICP, MS, OES uh, results. 
There's radionuclides, there's stable isotopes, we can use color. Uh, the South Africans and Australians, they like using magnetics. Um, Mineralogy has been a mainstay uh, by geologists who really call this approach provenance. And folks are more and more using DNA to figure out where sediment comes from. Okay, I'm gonna show some results from one place, one watershed I worked in. It's in Frederick County, it's Linganore Creek. It's, it's a forested agricultural uh, watershed which has eroding stream banks. Uh, I was out there for several years um, in, in 2008 to 2010, collecting many storm samples. And you can see the color that comes out of you is red and black, which is stream banks and agriculture. And when we run that through the model, we basically got a 50-50 answer here. It's banks and agriculture. So we told, we told Federal County, you know, it pays to really in, invest in both sort of practices to reduce sediment. Now, some could argue that banks have a direct delivery to the channel, and you might get the more bang for the buck out of controlling stream bank erosion. And there's nothing that, you know, that's, that's certainly uh, logical. So one thing that fingerprinting does, it tells you the sources of delivered sediment, but it doesn't tell you where to go. So if stream banks are an important source of sediment, where do we go in the watershed to discern which areas have the highest rates of stream bank erosion? Now, this brings in sort of the next generation of tools. Now, in the past, we might have looked at cross sections or bank pins over time and said, okay, these are the eroding reaches. But this is hit or miss, where you survey the channel and where you put in bank pins. But we live in a world now where we can get 3D data from LIDAR. We can look at the complete picture of stream channels and probably get an idea of where erosion is occurring, occurring in a stream channel. So we've got airborne LIDAR that we use, terrestrial LIDAR, and structure for motion. Um, LIDAR is, is, is basically light detection and raging. That's what its acronym stands for. It uses light in the form of pulsed laser, laser to measure ranges, variable, variable distances to the earth. And these light pulses combined with other data record by the airplane or by the terrestrial LIDAR. They generate exact distances and generate three-dimensional information about the shape of the earth and its surface characteristics. Depending on the unit, this can have accuracies at the centimeter scale. So this is an example of a LiDAR image. Again, from the plane we're shooting down, and what we're using is the lowest return. Because we, when we send down the light, pole, light pulse, we actually will, will pick up the canopy. So what we use is the lowest return to the ground, and we can generate a digital elevation model that's very accurate. Now, the beauty of this is if you have LiDAR images over time, you can detect geomorphic change. This is huge. So this is an example of we're looking at change in time from 2004 to 2018. And sure, you see some structural changes, you know, in roads and stuff. But here's just one area of the channel blown up where you can see where it's eroding and where it's degrading. Another example of this is the Little Patuxent River in Maryland, where I have 2011 LIDAR, 2017. We did the same thing, DEM uh, imaging. And we can see in the Patuxent River where bank erosion is occurring over the last six years. And those are the hotter red colors. So this is incredible. You know, now we're getting the entire bathtub. So if banks are an important source of sediment being delivered out of the watershed, we can actually use this emerging technologies to determine where banks are eroding. So that's really my talk in a nutshell. Uh, and really to summarize, uh, the bad news is that most of our rivers are impaired. Uh, and the causes are varied, but non-point sources, for example, sediment, turn out to be very important. The diagnosis is improving through time of where and how sediment is important using fingerprinting and LIDAR. And we know now that stream banks are a major source of sediment. And they also not just contain sediment, but if you look at publications from the Midwest, 
they actually also have phosphorus in the eroding stream banks. Now, is there hope? I didn't discuss the cures. That's another talk where we talk about the engineering methods and conservation practices, which are improving over time. And river restoration has become a popular choice for stabilizing channels. But luckily, you know, with the help of Dave Rosk and Lino Leopold, they're actually using geomorphic and engineering understanding of the system and designing for equilibrium when they come in and try to remediate the channel change. Well, there are some successes. Remember the Cuyahoga River that caught fire? Well, this is what it looks like today. You can actually paddle that river. So there is hope. And I want to thank you for allowing me to present uh, sort of my research and this discussion. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Alan. Um, so we'll open this up now for Q&A. There's a couple of ways that you can submit a question. You can raise your hand and we'll uh, pass you the mic um, and allow you to ask your question. Um, or you can submit a question in the Q&A at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, and to get us started, we do have some questions that were submitted along with the registration, Alan. Um, okay. So one is from Urban Coy, and um, Urban is a student with the Whiting School who asked, what was the seed that inspired you to pursue your field? What inspired me to pursue my field? Wow, that's, that's a great question. Now, I am a kid that grew up in Brooklyn where there are no rivers. So that's probably one thing I was deprived of rivers. Um, I had an amazing earth science teacher in high school, and that was really turned me on to geology. So when I started my undergraduate education, I knew I wanted to be a geologist, and I took geomorphology as one of those classes. I love rivers. To this day, they're just fascinating. You know, I'm one of these people when I drove, when you're driving, you know, hopefully when I'm not driving, when I'm a passenger, I'm always looking at the river that's underneath the bridge. So. It's, you know, we all have our callings in life and this turned out to be my calling. It's a great question. Thank you. Great, I'll pull another one. Um, so Susan Weirman, who is a faculty member with us as well, um, mm -hmm. asks the Ellicott City area has been flooded repeatedly mm -hmm. for centuries. <laughs> What's the best solution for that river system? Wow, you're asking a geologist engineering solutions. You know, what's interesting is I, I know a little bit about the history of that. You know, geologically, it's in an area sort of like a fanning area where when it rains, all these tributaries come in at the same time. Now, look, I think it's a common sense approach, which means, A, the area has been urbanized. There's impervious area. We know for a fact that increases peak flow. And just, you know, it brings the hydro period to a very short, very short interval. We need to slow down water. So we need to put some type of retention devices in the areas, in the upstream areas before it gets to Ellicott City. I mean, that just seems to me sort of a common sense approach to slow down the water before it gets to the channel. And if you look at some of those structures, I mean, I forgot the name of the tributary, tributary that goes in there, but it's, 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 it's almost piped. I mean, it's basically a culvert. So they just need to figure out a way to slow down the water. Great question. Yeah, I'm sure whomever figures that out will uh, have a nice retirement. <laughs> right, because we all love Ellicott City. Exactly, yeah. We don't want it to um, be a bad thing. So uh, I'll, since we're not getting any um, one submitted here, any hand raises yet, I'll keep going from the registration oh, list. Okay. Uh, so um, another Whiting School faculty member, Lawrence Husick is with us and he asks, should most dams be removed from rivers and streams to quickly restore ecosystems and habits? Should the public pay for this? Uh, I'm sorry, should what be removed? Uh, should uh, most dams be removed from rivers and streams? Oh, uh, and should the public pay for this? Mm -hmm. I'm going to not answer the second part of that because, <laughs> but uh, you know, and I guess I'm going to have to say this is my opinion. It seems to me 
in a lot of river systems, they should be removed. Um, I work on the Patapsco River, where they put in dams, you know, at the turn of the century. Some of it wasn't even for flood control. It was supposedly for hydroelectric, and they're not even using it anymore. And it turned out that's an important shad run in the, in the East Coast. So, you know, I, I think as humans, we're stewards of the land, and we have an obligation to the species that we also live with on the earth. And it's just the way it is. There's, there's few places in this, in this world that, that humans don't have an effect on. So look, it needs to be studied and understood. And I think if we can have a positive effect that might outweigh some other implication, like for example, flooding of a city, well, maybe that's a dam we shouldn't take out. I get it. But in some cases, some of these dams are old. We don't need them anymore. And they're impeding sort of, and I'm not an ecologist, but they're impeding sort of the migration of a lot of species. And maybe that increases, uh, uh, you know, recreation activities on that river, hiking, fishing. I mean, so, uh, you know, I'm in favor of it. It should be should be understood and studied. And, uh, you know, one, one thing I want to remark on, I, I mean, I showed these mill dams being removed. And that those have occurred for the most part because we let them go. But when we decide we're going to remove rivers, the dams or rivers, obviously that needs strong engineering practices. And in a lot of places, we need to monitor the effect of that because we're putting a pulse of sediment down that system. So maybe that's not a good thing to do. Maybe there's something happening downstream which isn't going to be happy about sediment, you know, coming down there and covering it. So again, we really need to analyze why we're doing it, how we do it, and what are the repercussions, and maybe even monitor the effect of that, both from a a hydrologic sediment stand, standpoint, and of course, from the biologic standpoint. And believe me, I mentioned the word monitoring, but that's another discussion in itself because we don't do a really good job of monitoring our river systems. But again, another, another good question that's buzzing me to yak on. <laughs> Great, thanks Alan for that insight. Uh, I have another one for you from Daniel Newman, who was a student with the Whiting School. Uh, mm -hmm. Daniel asks, how can environments built on mostly cohesionless soil sustainably deal with sediment transport? Okay, do me a favor, say, say that again. I'm going to have to try sure. to context the question. Go ahead. Yep. How can environments built on mostly cohesionless soil, soils sustainably deal with sediment transport? Oh, you're talking about environmental spills on cohesionless soil deal with environmental, oh, oh God. So, um, you know what? I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna have to punt here. I really don't know that. I haven't studied that in my career. Um, I, you know, I'm more familiar with spills that go directly in the channels. And I'm thinking of the Durango spill, which I believe was also due to an impoundment failure, um, you know, that happened there. Um, Spills that occur on the landscape on cohesionless soils. Um, I, I'd, I'd probably need the person to give me a little more information. I'm just a little bit vague on what they're shooting for with that question. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. And I don't see Daniel um, yeah. in the participants right now. So uh, we'll, we'll just move on from there. Okay. okay. Thanks, Alan. Yep. Um, so I have um, another student question from Alex Montoya. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question is, what actions are being taken to address disturbed rivers? And mm -hmm. who might be the key players currently and in the future to affect change? Uh, there you go. That's a good question. So who are the key players? Well, you know, it's funny. These, so these rivers are disturbed. Again, it goes, you know, why do we even care? It goes back to the Clean Water Act where we want to improve the health of our rivers. So first of all, there's legal requirements. That's, that's where it all begins with. And because of that, the states are required by law to do something about these rivers. It comes down to typically, it depends on the state, but it'll either come down to the state or county level. They go ahead and assess those rivers. And you saw from that map, they're not doing a great job. 
And there's basically an accounting of what they have to do to basically remediate the problem. Now, if it turns out that it's stream bank erosion, they will reach out to the community, usually consulting firms, to figure out how to remediate it. So again, this goes back to really a part of my talk, figuring out where and what is the main source of the pollutant is really important. Because that tells you where, if consulting firm phones are going off the hook or soil conservation agencies have to get involved. Um, so I think that answered that question of, of really, you know, how are we and why are we sort of interested in these disturbed rivers? Because they're really the ones that are, are showing up on, on the impaired water list. Uh, I hope that answered the question. That's a good question. Oops. Alan, we've got a question uh, live in the Q&A here. Yeah. It's a, a little bit prosaic. I'll read it to you, um, but it's, it's a long one. Sticking okay. with the subject of dam removal, when a mm -hmm. dam is intentionally removed, one mm -hmm. management strategy for sediment management post-removal, mm -hmm. assuming no contamination, is mm -hmm. to allow it to vegetate and stabilize in place. Mm -hmm. If it is all excavated, as was done at Big Spring Run, mm -hmm. that sediment needs to find a home in an upland. Often that is in a landfill, which is extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. Stream reaches downstream of dams are frequently sediment starved and mm -hmm. quote unquote bony and may mm -hmm. benefit from the addition of fines. Do you have an opinion mm -hmm. on downstream release of sediment following yeah, dam removal? Yeah. Actually a great question. Now, now, Big Spring Run though, let's talk about that first because that's, that's not really a dam re removal. That's a floodplain removal project. And that's a good question. Well, it turns out that that the material that they were excavating is highly fertile topsoil. So they actually wound up selling it to offset the costs of, of actually removing legacy sediment. Okay, so that's a separate issue than when we have a dam on the Patapsco River, because you're right. The channel below a, a dam, and think back to the lane diagram, we are now removing sediment from the system. So the scale is going to tilt down. Those rivers are starved. They're incised. They're incised down to bedrock or to down in material they can't uh, excavate anymore. So there are two approaches that I've seen. Some is they actually try to dredge the material out of the dam and not just let it go. And that raises the question absolutely of where do we put the dredged material, assuming that it's not contaminated. And I know this from experience with Conowingo Dam, where the Army Corps wanted to dredge out the stuff behind the dam. Now, they weren't going to remove that dam. Um, and I basically think they were not able, they, were, they never found a suitable landfill site for that material. That's a problem. Okay, so now we're left with the other alternative, uh, which is to say, let's remove the dam. And typically that's done by a variety of methods, including explosions, where they let it go in one explosion. And I'm thinking of the Marmot Dam out west. And if you take my class, I talk about that explosion. Others are where they go through a series of stages and they remove sediment from the dam in a series of stages. And I think that might actually help in, in sediment-starved systems if they remove it and therefore it doesn't degrade the channel. And as I'm talking, I'm thinking about a better answer to that question, which comes down to the lane diagram. You know, it could be that below that channel, if we did a hydraulic study, we could probably figure out well, what amount of sediment actually be transported through that reach, let's say just through a HECRAS model. And therefore, we might be able to say, okay, let's let's release one third of the dam because in three years' time, that's going to move through, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you're right. In some river systems, if we let all that sediment go, it's going to aggrade the channel, almost the Mount St. Helens picture. It might become vegetated over time and become stable. That might not be a good thing. So what am I talking about here? I'm talking about careers for engineers and geomorphologists, because as a patient, you don't want to give a drug to a person and say, okay, you know what, here it is, I never want to see you again. We need to understand what the dosage is to these folks, and we need to understand 
the diagnosis, the dosage, and what's, you know, to come back and see how you're doing. So it takes science to understand how to remove sediment from a dam. And I think that's really the answer. Thanks, Al. That's, that's Thanks. a great answer and a great question, Carly. Thank yeah, you for that. Absolutely. We we have time for one more here. And okay. um it's uh what are some general strategies for improving our monitoring program to build more mm -hmm. robust process understanding of sediment sources and transport? Okay. Now this could be a a, a, a talk of mine, but I'm glad it's an ending uh, question. Okay. So first of all, I know this from being in this part of the world for 20 plus years and growing up here. We've, especially in the last 20 years, they've done so many engineering designs to the channels in just the Baltimore County area. I've been to these sites. We don't monitor them. And the reason I'm hearing is that there's no, it, that takes away money from remediation if we monitor it. So how should we be monitoring? We should be measuring suspended sediment loads over time. And that's what they did in this spring run. They actually did it before and after. How do you even know that actually worked? There's only one way to know it, which is by monitoring it either with a paired watershed approach or doing a before and after. Now, I mentioned Dave Rosgan in the closing uh, slide here. He's just a, a, a forest service geomorphologist, ecologist, and now he's a professional engineer. That using geomorphic principles, he designs for dynamic equilibrium. I know Dave. I called Dave about mm, seven years ago and said, because we were, we were having a, re, a uh, monitoring meeting. I said, Dave, you know, I need some data from one of your, you know, restoration designs that shows, or we, you know, where we measured sediment. He goes, Alan, we've never done it. I said, how is that possible? That all the hundreds, probably reaching thousands of restoration areas that use your design, nobody has measured sediment before and after. Now, I think it's changing a little bit. I've heard of some river systems in Baltimore where they're, they're measuring it, but you know, it's it, then I, as a geomorphologist working for the USGS, well, how are we actually measuring sediment loads? Because there's a right way to do that as well. You can't just take a sample once in a while from a river system. There has to be a, a robust methodology. So again, I really think, now I, I get it that we can't afford to monitor every single river. But I think we want to know if that's the reason for this type of restoration is what has sediment been doing over time is we need to measure suspended sediment before and after. And that's, you know, it just seems we owe it to ourselves and the public to know what's working. And if we knew what's working over time, it's definitely going to help the next generation. So really thank you for that, <laughs> that question. And we could talk about on you know, offline of, of really how we monitor suspended sediment, because that's what I've been spending my career doing, is measuring sediment. So thank you. Thanks, Alan. Uh, we have one more question that just okay. popped in, if you if you don't mind sparing a couple no, more minutes. No, I could talk all day. Uh, great. So this one uh, is from Chris, and Chris asks, are there steps individual landowners or communities can take to rehabilitate stre stream banks that have experienced significant erosion? Sure, there are. Um, they, you know, it, it's funny when you, when you, if you drive around Lancaster County and you look at the streams, you're gonna come back to me and say, yeah, I know what's missing, it's trees. They don't have a riparian corridor. So tree planting seem like something that a community can do. Now, having said that, there's also trees, and I'm not a botanist, but there are folks, the USDA, that have studied what trees put it the longest root uh, length to actually hold the soil in place, what does the best job of that? And there are answers to that. We know what species actually do a better job of holding the stream bank in place. So the community can do um, basically plantings over time. Um, they can monitor by just even taking pictures of stream banks and saying, you know, I'm getting worried that that stream bank is actually going to erode into a road or bridge. So we can think about that that way as well, you know, thinking about which which 
sort of eroding stream banks might turn into a problem. But I, I really think the communities could be going ahead and uh, doing tree plantings because that's certainly going to improve, improve habitat and design. And, and possibly folks that are on this phone call that do more remediation than I do might actually also have an answer. Thanks. Great, thanks so much, Alan. We really appreciate you joining us today. Yeah. It's great to hear from you um, and uh, to discuss such a such an interesting and important topic. So you thanks a lot. Thank and, you. Uh, yep. All right. Take care and thanks for joining us, uh, the folks who are attending. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next uh, event. Uh, we'll be sending out an email and updating uh, Teams and the website. So be on the lookout. Thanks so much, right. everyone. Have a great day. Take care. Bye. Bye.